Well, look, comrades, friends and supporters, on behalf of the Socialist Equality Party, I would like to welcome you to our public meeting entitled COVID-19 and the Lessons of 2020, a socialist perspective for the struggles ahead. My name is Max Boddy, and I'm the Assistant National Secretary of the SEP, and I'll be chairing this afternoon's meeting. Just to begin with some small housekeeping, as I mentioned to those who logged in earlier, there is a chat box that one can use uh, where you can type in either greetings or later on questions and answers when we open up for questions and answers. The agenda uh, for this afternoon's meeting We'll begin with a series of four reports from comrades who are introduced very soon. We will then open up for, as I said, the question and answers before going on to a call for a collection for our monthly fund and finishing on a series of announcements. And just to begin, we have characterized the COVID-19 pandemic as a trigger event in world history. One which has brought to the surface the underlying contradictions of the capitalist system. Prior to the pandemic, decades of financial parasitism and capitalist plunder had created a global social, economic and political crisis. A society of record breaking levels of social inequality, the unending drive to war and militarism and the universal assault on basic democratic rights. All these have been accelerated by the pandemic. There are now more than 66 million cases of COVID-19 across the globe and more than 1.5 million deaths. These numbers are only increasing daily. In the United States, the worst possible case scenario has come to pass. The virus is completely out of control. Now the spread and devastation of this virus was entirely preventable. Governments of countries in Europe, the United States and Australia were warned of the dangers of this virus as early as February, but hid it from the population. They then utilized the lockdowns to pass measures that handed out trillions of dollars to big business and the corporations. The International Committee of the Fourth International, its sections in the Socialist Equality Parties and the World Socialist website warned about the potential devastation of the virus and also provided the working class with a perspective to fight it. In early March this year, after the virus had been spreading throughout the United States for weeks undetected, we published a statement calling for the immediate shutdown of all auto and non-essential production throughout the country. Warning that while Trump and the Democrats had made available $1.5 trillion to major banks, mere pennies had been offered to fight the virus. While large gatherings had been banned, auto plants and other industries were to remain open to pump out profits for the rich. We warned that no consideration was being taken to protect the lives of the working class and that for workers to protect themselves, they had to organize independently, breaking with the unions and the Democrats. This had to be done through the formation of rank and file committees to shut down production. As we wrote at the time, quote, the coronavirus pandemic has exposed graphically the class divisions at the heart of American society. And it poses directly the question, who runs society? By recklessly endangering the lives of millions of people, the capitalist class and the two parties of big business have forfeited their right to rule, end quote. By May, the virus was out of control. At that stage, there were more than 20,000 new cases and approximately 1,500 deaths a day in the US alone. After implementing limited lockdowns, itself a response to the growing militancy of the working class, and with the passing of the CARES Act, there were demands by business to reopen the economy and get back to work. The slogan that was taken up by capitalist governments across the globe was that the cure could not be worse than the disease. And they were almost universally embracing the homicidal herd immunity policy. In response, we wrote in May, quote, if infection, sickness and death are to be prevented, it is necessary to create a new form of workplace organization that oversees and enforces safe working conditions. We went on. There can be no business as usual. 
the pandemic exposes the urgent necessity for a complete restructuring of the processes of production, distribution, and economic activity in general. The lives of working people and their families must not be sacrificed in the interests of corporate profits and the private wealth of the billionaire oligarchs, end quote. Now, this call was taken up by workers in different industries across the US and internationally, including in the UK, across Europe, Sri Lanka, and Australia. What was becoming clearer for workers was that the question of independent organizations was not just an abstract conception, but was a life and death question. Then on May 25th, just four days after the statement I just quoted calling for rank and file committees was published, the global explosions in opposition to the murder of George Floyd erupted. Now the ruling elite looked at these protests with intense nervousness. The most striking feature of the protests was their multi-ethnic, multi-racial character. The perspective of the Democratic Party, Labor, and the pseudo-left organizations was to channel this movement behind a racialist narrative and to a perspective of identity politics. Now, since the beginning of this month, mass working class resistance has erupted internationally. The criminal neglect by every capitalist government to co the COVID-19 pandemic is triggering these protests. However, they occur under very changed conditions. A critical factor in the outcome of these struggles is the role of our party to penetrate deeply into the development, into the developing movement of workers to provide it with a Marxist political perspective in order to transform the various spontaneous eruptions of resistance into a class conscious struggle for socialism. And it was this concept that was behind the relaunching of our website, the WSWS, on October 2nd this year. The relaunch was more than just a technical redesign. Above all, it was to make available and accessible the vast collection of articles, statements, and historical documents relating to the entire history of the Marxist movement to the international working class. The changes in the WSWS were made with the expectation of a vast increase in readership and interest by workers in history, socialist politics, and theory. And in just the first 20, sorry, in the first 23 days of the relaunch, it was announced by comrade David North in his speech to the rally welcoming the relaunch of the website that there had been approximately 2,300,000 visits to the site and more than 3 million page views. And by all accounts, this number has only increased since. It is now more critical than ever for the working class and young people to develop an independent perspective outside of the control of the unions and the various labor and democratic parties. For this to occur, they require a socialist perspective and a revolutionary party to lead them. That party is the Socialist Equality Party. To discuss these developments and more, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker of this afternoon's meeting. Conrad Evram Yazgan is an SEP National Committee member and a leader of our youth and student movement, the International Youth and Students for Social Equality. He has been in the party for more than four years and in that time has led the fight on Melbourne University campus for reaffiliation against the anti-democratic attacks by the student union. He is also a writer for the World Socialist website. Evren will be speaking on the situation and experiences confronting young people as a result on the, of the pandemic. Now, normally in public meetings, when we're all together, we can give him a warm welcome with a clap, but you'll just have to settle, settle today, Evren, with me saying on behalf of the audience here today, I wish to give you a very warm welcome. Thank you, Max. And uh, welcome to everyone, comrades, friends, and listeners uh, to this very important meeting of the SEP. Um, as the year draws to a close, it is clear that the experiences of 2020 have been etched into the memory of an entire generation. The past 12 months have revealed the reality of social conditions for millions of workers and youth around the world. The criminal response of the ruling elite in country after country to the COVID-19 pandemic has placed young people on the front lines of the crisis. In particular, youth have been forced back into schools as part of the so-called reopening of the economy 
and the murderous policy of herd immunity, pursued by governments to shore up the profits of the tiny wealthy minority at the expense of the lives of workers and their families. This is most stark in the US, Europe and Latin America, which are seeing their highest levels of COVID-19 infections and deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. Against the warnings of medical experts and all reputable science, the ruling elite have pushed for the return to school on the, uh, on the lie that young people are safe from and do not spread the virus. The result has been tragic. The World Socialist website, the online publication of our movement, the World Trotskyist movement, has documented the devastating result of this criminal policy on youth. In numerous articles, the WSWS has recorded the deaths of young people in the United States to COVID-19. In August, the WSWS reported on the deaths of 16 and 17 year olds and children as young as nine in Florida. Peyton Baumgarth died of COVID-19 in Missouri on October 31, becoming one of the youngest victims of the coronavirus in the US. He was only 13 years old. 19-year-old Chad Dorrell of Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina, and 18-year-old Michael Lang, a freshman at the University of Dayton in Ohio, died from COVID-19. Both were described as healthy, fit young people with no underlying conditions. Both caught the virus after returning to university. Also dying from COVID-19, was a 15 year old girl in Kentucky, Alexa Rose Veit, who had Down syndrome and just last year had been successfully treated for leukemia. Her tragic death prompted the belated closing of in-person instruction in all of the state's public and private schools. The immense physical dangers amid the pandemic coincide with the massive social, economic and political impact of the virus that the virus has had on young people around the world. Even more than before, the future confronting young people is one of joblessness, the high cost of living, unaffordable housing, debt, and financial stress. The pandemic has led to huge job losses with young people on the front lines. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, 28% of employees aged 18 to 24 were thrown out of work in March and April. Half of those who retained their jobs were on fewer hours. Amid a corporate offensive against jobs and conditions being enforced by the unions, unemployment rates have skyrocketed further. If you combine young people who are not working as many hours as they want to, and those who are without a job, the real rate of youth underemployment and unemployment is over 48%. The increased stresses on youth brought about by the escalated attacks on jobs and living conditions has accelerated trends of increasing mental health issues among the youth. A University of Melbourne study showed that almost a quarter of those aged 18 to 24 reported high levels of mental stress distress compared to 9% in 2017. Only those aged 25 to 34 report more mental distress due to the stresses felt by employed parents with primary school aged children. These same pressures are being felt by youth around the world. In the US, researchers found alarming rates of depression with nearly half of the young adult population showing at least moderate depressive symptoms in October close to 10 times the pre-pandemic rate, accompanied uh, by skyrocketing youth suicide rates. It is no surprise that young people presented with a bleak future are suffering. The source of this suffering is the global breakdown of the capitalist system. In its insatiable pursuit of profits, the capitalist class and its representatives in governments around the world are employing increasingly brutal, antisocial, and counter-revolutionary moves. The response of the ruling elite around the world to the COVID-19 pandemic has been anti-scientific and murderous. Despite warnings from experts, 
the ruling elite has actively pursued policies that have led to the deaths of over 1.5 million and the infection of tens of millions more. Faced with not only COVID-19, but also the existential dangers of war and climate change, young people need to base themselves on a Marxist analysis. Warnings of the horrors of a nuclear war have failed to halt the escalation of imperialist militarism. Equally, appeals to capitalist politicians to enact policies that would reverse climate change have fallen on deaf ears. This is because these developments are systemic. They are the product of the social relations of capitalism, based on the private ownership of the means of production and the irrational division of a globally integrated world into antagonistic nation states, each advancing the interests of their own ruling elite. The struggle to end war and safeguard the planet, therefore, requires the fight to overthrow capitalism. The breakdown of the profit system produces not only social devastation and calamity, it also impels the working class into struggle. Young workers and youth will be at the forefront, and we are already witnessing this. In September and October, thousands of Greek high school students occupied over 700 schools, opposing the murderous policy of herd immunity and demanding huge investments in education rather than the military. This growing unrest in Greece has grown into a far broader movement of workers against anti-strike laws and the government's response to the pandemic. Young people have also been active in recent confrontations with police in France in protests against police violence, as was the case in the US just several months earlier in response to the brutal police murder of George Floyd. There have been school strikes by youth in the US and elsewhere against the reopening of schools amid the surging COVID-19 case numbers and deaths. High school students and youth in Germany, the US and elsewhere have formed and joined rank and file committees with their teachers to organize the opposition to school reopenings. The fear among the ruling elite is that such movements are growing. The ruling elite are seeking to prevent any unified struggle by workers and youth by promoting identity politics to divide people along the lines of race, gender and sexual or orientation. Such politics is an attempt to divert mass social discontent back behind reactionary channels by obscuring the real division in society, that of class. The way forward for youth and students coming of political age amid the greatest breakdown of capitalism since the 1930s is the fight for socialist revolutionary politics. There are growing numbers of young people who are seeking an alternative and are becoming attracted to socialism and Marxism. What is required is a turn to the sole revolutionary force in society, the world working class, united across national boundaries, races, genders, etc. I urge all of you listening in today to play your part in the transformation of society. Take up the fight for socialist internationalism and help build a world free of poverty, imperialist war, climate catastrophe and dictatorship. Join the only worldwide movement of young people which fights for this perspective, the International Youth and Students for Social Equality. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Evram. Again, I, I send thank you on behalf of the audience here today. Our next speaker today is Comrade Mike Head. He has been a member of our party for more than 40 years and is also a member of the SEP National Committee. His name will be familiar to those who often read the World Socialist website as he is a regular writer on the bipartisan assault against democratic rights, as well as on other political, economic and social issues. Comrade Mike will be speaking on the recent war crimes report in Australia, the international drive to war and the anti-China campaign. Again, on behalf of the audience here, Mike, I wish to give you a very warm welcome. Thanks, Max. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, vital discussion. After years of cover-up 
at the highest levels of the military and governments, both Liberal, National and Labor. Some of the war crimes inflicted by Australian military units on the people of Afghanistan have been officially admitted. The long delayed war crimes report is a whitewash produced by the military itself. It not only exonerates the military high command, but also every government involved. None of the individual soldiers accused of murder is named and any prosecutions will take a decade or more. In fact, all the indications are that no such prosecutions will ultimately proceed. Six full volumes of the report with an unknown number of pages are blacked out completely in order to hide the specific and gruesome details. Nonetheless, the report is a devastating indictment of all the governments and ruling establishments from Washington to London and Canberra responsible for this criminal war conducted by US imperialism. As our party said in its statement posted on the World Socialist website this week, quote, everyone responsible for the military's crimes in Afghanistan and the war of aggression itself, including successive liberal national coalition and Labor Party prime ministers, governments and military high command should be placed on trial for crimes against humanity just as the Nazi leaders were after World War II. In the words of the report, there is quote, credible evidence that special forces units murdered at least 39 prisoners of war or innocent victims, innocent civilians, and committed many other abuses, including what the report calls cruel treatment, that is torture. The report acknowledges that the victims included two 14 year old teenagers whose throats were slit. In fact, military insiders said this was routine. According to page 120 of the report, quote, special forces would cordon off a, a whole village, taking men and boys to guest houses, which were typically on the edge of a village. There they would be tied up and tortured by special forces, sometimes for days. When the special forces left, the men and boys would be found dead, shot in the head or blindfolded and with throats slit. So systematic were the killings that special forces recruits were quite blooded by being ordered to kill captured detainees. This cannot be explained as the actions of isolated individuals at the lowest ranks of the armed forces. Rather, it underscores the nature of the war in Afghanistan, like that in Iraq. These are neo-colonial wars for resources and geostrategic domination over the Middle East and Central Asia, in which the entire occupied populations are regarded as the enemy. Such blooding also points to the brutalization of the military itself in preparation for new wars. By the report's own admission, the so-called warrior culture began domestically in military training and indoctrination, not in Afghanistan. Yet the media headlines over the past week have seen no outcry against these killings, no demands for a genuine independent investigation, no calls for those responsible to be held to account. Instead, the media has been dominated by a witch hunt against China for daring to criticize these crimes. A social media meme posted by a middle ranking Chinese official depicting an act of throat slitting was denounced by Prime Minister Scott Morrison, the Labour Party, the Greens and the media. They were joined by the governments in Britain, France and the US, as well as New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. All these governments have had their own war crimes revelations to bury. According to virtually every prominent figure in the political establishment, the Chinese tweet was, quote, disgusting, repugnant, or sickening. No such outrage has been expressed about the war crimes themselves. No one has questioned ex-Prime Minister Julia Gillard, under whose Greens backed Labour government, most of the reported killings and abuses occurred, 
as she rushed to join President Barack Obama's so-called surge in Afghanistan in 2011, 2012. This is not just staggering hypocrisy. An editorial in The Australian accused China of conducting, quote, gray zone warfare, as if a Chinese political cartoon tweeted by a foreign ministry official was an act of war. That response points to the real agenda behind the war crimes report, as well as the ongoing demonization of China. The entire military is being revamped and geared up for new US led wars, including a potentially catastrophic nuclear war against China. The special forces aren't being shut down. That is because they will play a key role in any such war. Last year, in fact, Morrison's government announced a $3 billion funding boost to the special forces over the next two decades. This is part of a massive expansion of military spending with $575 billion allocated over a decade. The ruling class in Australia and its partners in Washington never wanted these war crimes to be revealed. In the end, they were forced by the sheer volume of leaks and evidence from devastated Afghani families into a damage control operation. And the only ones being prosecuted are the whistleblowers. Ex-military lawyer David McBride faces a closed door trial for allegedly leaking documents to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation in 2017, exposing a litany of war crimes. WikiLeaks publisher Julian Assange, who was responsible for the greatest exposure of US and allied war crimes in Afghanistan. That was the 2010 release of 75,000 documents from US Army war logs, remains incarcerated. His life endangered in a COVID infected British prison facing extradition to the United States on trumped up espionage charges. The war crimes in Afghanistan are not an aberration on the supposed glorious record of the Australian military. They follow more than a hundred years of such events as outlined by the report itself. From the Anglo Boer War of 1899 to 1902 to the televised carnage of the Vietnam War. Special Forces soldiers were sent back to Afghanistan repeatedly up to 16 times each. Coalition and Labor governments alike feared that if regular trips were dispatched, they would suffer casualties that would fuel anti-war sentiment as erupted during the Vietnam War and the 2003 invasion of Iraq, which triggered huge anti-war protests across Australia and internationally. Now a wartime-like atmosphere is being created in an effort to drown out anti-war sentiment. So-called foreign interference laws were introduced with US support and bipartisan backing in 2018 as part of the intensifying US-led confrontation against China. For the first time, criminal offences, which carry up to 20 years imprisonment, now apply to undertaking political activity in partnership with an overseas organisation. The outlawed activities could extend to anyone opposing Australian involvement in a US-led military conflict with China. In the latest move targeting China, the Morrison government, backed by the Labor Party, is currently pushing through Parliament a foreign relations bill to give the federal government the power to veto anyone, any state, sorry, any state, local or university agreement with China. The military overhaul is also a preparation to deal with political and social discontent at home amid worsening economic inequality and preparations for war. The killings in Afghanistan are a warning of the methods that will be used internally. There is not one rule for Afghani teenagers and another for workers and youth at home. In 2018 as well, laws were passed, supported by the Labor Party again, to give governments and military generals expanded powers to call out troops to suppress what is referred to as, quote, domestic violence. Further such powers are currently being legislated following the unprecedented mobilization of thousands of soldiers during the bushfire disaster and the COVID-19 emergency. These deployments were designed to condition public opinion 
to the presence of troops on the streets. As the Socialist Equality Party said in its December the 1st statement, our movement's record is clear. On October the 9th, 2001, two days after Washington launched its Afghanistan invasion, the World Socialist Website Editorial Board published a statement titled, Why We Oppose the War in Afghanistan. It explained that this was an imperialist war in which Washington aimed to, quote, exert hegemonic control over Central Asia. The statement warned of the disastrous consequences of this turn to war to uphold the dominance that the US asserted after World War II. It stated, quote, imperialism threatens mankind at the beginning of the 21st century with a repetition on a more horrific scale of the tragedies of the 20th. The war crimes in Afghanistan, along with the deaths of some 175,000 civilians and the millions or more deaths in Iraq confirm that warning. In 2016, the International Committee of the Fourth International issued a statement, Socialism and the Fight Against War, amid the escalating US war drive against China and Russia. It explained that to prevent a new world war, an anti-war movement had to be built on a definite political basis. That is a unified struggle of the international working class to put an end to the capitalist profit system, the root cause of imperialist wars in the fight for a socialist future. We urge everyone participating in this meeting to take up this fight by joining the Socialist Equality Party. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Mike, for that you know, critical uh, uh, report. Uh, I think um, you know, I think it'll, it's really important. I mean, just before we move on to the next meet, speaker, I do want to remind, firstly, remind everyone in attendance that you have an option to uh, participate in the chat. There is a button uh, in the bottom of your screen that looks like a little dialogue bubble. Click on that. If you would like to participate in the chat, just remember to click to make sure you uh, click the little button to say to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see it. I see some people are participating in the discussion and, and asking questions. We are taking note of those questions and, and we'll bring them in the question and answer session. And I also uh, would like to welcome, I know that there are supporters now from the Philippines who have joined our meeting. So uh, very much like to welcome you. Our next speaker is Comrade Tom Peters. Uh, Comrade Tom is the leader of the Socialist Equality Group in New Zealand. And has been a member since 2010 and a regular writer on the World Socialist website, writing extensively on the political, social and economic events in New Zealand and in the Asia Pacific region. Comrade Tom will be reviewing the experiences of the working class in New Zealand over the course of this pandemic, reporting on the significance of the recent New Zealand election outcome. So on behalf of the audience here today, again, I welcome, I give you a very warm welcome, Comrade Tom. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to address this meeting on behalf of the Socialist Equality Group, which is fighting here to build a section of the International Committee of the Fourth International uh, even more than Australia, perhaps, the world's media presents New Zealand as the model for other countries. You are, all, you are all probably familiar by now with the relentless glorification of Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern. After her Labour Party was re-elected with an overall majority in October, the New York Times described this as, quote, a beacon of hope for those seeking an anti-Trump model of government led by charismatic women with an emphasis on inclusion and competence. The middle class pseudo left groups here agree. Jacobin magazine, which campaigned for Joseph Biden in the US election, uh, published an article by a New Zealand union official describing Labour's victory as quote, a win for the whole political left and for working people. The International Socialist Organization Socialist Aotearoa, the trade union backed daily blog and countless other uh, publications all made similar statements. 
this is a narrative based on lies. It falsifies the Labour government's record over the last three years for a definite reactionary political purpose. With millions of young people and workers attracted to socialism, Ardern is being offered as, as proof that capitalism doesn't need to be overthrown. All it needs is for the right people to be in charge. The Socialist Equality Group, however, is the only tendency that opposes the Labour Party government, uh, which includes the Green Party, from a socialist standpoint. We say clearly that this is a right-wing government carrying out historic attacks on the working class and cementing New Zealand's position in US war preparations against China. The fact that New Zealand has not suffered mass deaths from COVID-19 has been falsely attributed to Ardern's leadership. In fact, her government imposed a lockdown in late March because it feared mass action by teachers, healthcare workers, and tens of thousands of other workers who signed petitions demanding a lockdown independently of the trade unions which opposed such measures. In 2018 and 2019, the government was shaken by nationwide strikes by teachers and nurses, uh, which were part of a global upsurge of class struggle against austerity. The union bureaucracy betrayed these workers, telling them there was no money to fix the crisis. Hospitals remain completely underfunded and unprepared should there be a major outbreak of the, of the coronavirus. The government's main response to the pandemic was to protect the rich. It diverted tens of billions of dollars to corporations through subsidies, loans, and bailouts. The Reserve Bank is currently printing $100 billion to buy bonds from the private banks, which is an astronomical sum for a small country such as New Zealand. The trade unions have played a key role suppressing resistance as tens of thousands of workers have been made redundant and businesses have been restructured. Nearly 12% of the working age population is now on welfare. The Ardern government's policies are fueling a speculative frenzy in the housing market, with the median house price in Auckland now over a million dollars. In Porirua, a working class area north of Wellington, the average weekly rent has now reached $625, which is higher than Sydney or Melbourne. That is almost equivalent to the median weekly income, which was $652 in June, after plummeting by 7.6% in the space of 12 months. Under Labour, the waiting list for public housing has exploded from 6,000 to more than 21,000 families. That, that means there are tens of thousands of people living in caravans, garages, and overcrowded or rundown houses. Demand for charities has doubled or even tripled in some areas, and more than 20% of people are expected to rely on food parcels over the Christmas period. The Labour Party, which in 2017 falsely promised to address poverty and the housing crisis, is implementing the biggest transfer of wealth to the rich ever in this country's history, while workers are being plunged into poverty. Labour came to power in 2017 thanks to a coalition deal with the right-wing New Zealand First Party. For three years, Labour and the Greens gave New Zealand First the major role in government. This anti-immigrant and viciously anti-Chinese party controlled the foreign affairs and defence ministries. After the 2017 election, during the protracted talks to try and form a new government, US Ambassador Scott Brown made very clear that the Trump administration preferred a Labour Party New Zealand First coalition and that Washington opposed the Conservative National Party because of its pursuit of stronger economic relations with China. The National Party has been profoundly destabilized by an anti-China campaign in the media. It has had three different leaders this year alone and its support collapsed to just over 25% in the election. 
many of wealthy suburbs largely voted for the Labour Party, seeing it as the more stable and reliable option and grateful for its policies benefiting the super rich. The deeply unpopular New Zealand First did not win any seats in Parliament this time round, but Labour carries on its nationalist policies. After posing as a kind and compassionate government after the fascist terror attack in Christchurch last year, the Ardern government has discriminated against immigrants and scapegoated them for the social crisis. Thousands of people who are legally entitled to live here are stranded overseas and barred from returning. Many of them have lost their homes and their jobs and are separated from family members. Those in New Zealand who do not have residency and who've lost their jobs due to the economic crisis uh, have been unable to access welfare payments for the majority of the year. Soon after being re-elected, the Ardern government assured Washington of its ongoing loyalty. Jacinda Ardern refused to condemn Donald Trump's moves to overturn the US election result and establish a presidential dictatorship. She has invited President-elect Joe Biden to visit New Zealand to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the ANZUS Cold War Alliance next year. And Ardern is working closely with both Washington and Canberra to strengthen New Zealand's own military presence in the Pacific to ensure its interests as an imperialist power in the region. Significantly, Ardern has not denounced the mass murder of unarmed people, including children, uh, that by Australian forces that has been exposed in Afghanistan. New Zealand itself has been implicated in atrocities against the Afghan people, which this Labour government continues to cover up. Ardern and her new foreign minister, Nanaya Mahuta, joined in the hysterical attacks on the Chinese official's tweet, which condemned these war crimes. Mahuta uh, has been glorified internationally as the first Maori woman to become foreign minister. And she claims to understand, quote, the impact of colonization on indigenous people. This fraud has been very quickly exposed by her support for war in Afghanistan and for the anti-China campaign. The conditions here for revolutionary upheaval are rapidly maturing, as they are in every country. The betrayal of the nurses and the teachers demonstrates that workers need to rebel against the pro-capitalist unions and to form new independent rank and file committees in every workplace to fight for their class interests. But what is most urgently required is a party that can provide the necessary political leadership that will fight to break the working class from the Labour Party and its pseudo left apologists and to unite workers internationally to abolish capitalism and to restructure society along socialist lines. So I would urge listeners in New Zealand, Australia and wherever you are in the world to contact us and to join us in this historic struggle. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Tom. For our final and main report this afternoon, I'm pleased to welcome Comrade Cheryl. Comrade Cheryl Crisp is the National Secretary of the SEP. Cheryl was a founding member of the Socialist Labour League, the forerunner of the SEP in 1972, and has played a leading role in the Trotskyist movement in Australia for more than four decades. She writes on the World Socialist website and has been a frequent speaker at our international events and rallies, including recently speaking at our rally, welcoming the relaunch of the WSWS in late October. Welcome, Comrade Cheryl. Thanks, Max. And I join with all the other speakers in welcoming uh, everybody here today um, to participate in this discussion. On January 3rd of this year, the, in the New Year statement written by Comrades North and Kishore on the World Socialist website, it began with the sentence, the arrival of the new year marks the beginning of a decade of intensifying class struggle and World Socialist revolution. The statement continued, 
In the future, when learned historians write about the upheavals of the 21st century, they will enumerate all the obvious signs that existed as the 2020s began of the revolutionary storm that was soon to sweep across the globe. The scholars with a vast array of facts, documents, charts, website and social media postings and other forms of valuable digitized information at their disposal will describe the 2010s as a period characterized by an intractable economic, social and political crisis of the world capitalist system. Of course, January the 3rd was prior to the outbreak of the pandemic and the comrades nor the International Committee could know that within two months of that very insightful assessment, the world would be transformed. But it has to be said that the International Committee, the Socialist Equality Parties and the World Socialist website alone were able to make such an assessment. The conditions under which we meet today can only be described as unprecedented. More than 66 million people worldwide have been infected by coronavirus. More than one and a half million are dead. These figures are without doubt underestimates. In country after country, the virus is now out of control, not because it's not known how it can be controlled, but because of the conscious decisions of capitalist governments. Turkey has recorded its 10th straight day of record deaths. India has recorded almost 10 million infections and 140,000 deaths. Brazil, six and a half million infections, 176,000 deaths. In the United Kingdom and Europe, the virus continues to spread exponentially. But it is in the United States, the richest country on earth and the leading economy with the most powerful military and the most billionaires where the impact of the homicidal policy of herd immunity is reaping its most deadly price. It has the highest number of infections in the world at almost 15 million and the highest death toll at almost 288,000. A country with 4% of the world's population has more than 20% of infections and almost the same percentage of deaths. There is now virtually no pretense by state or federal governments in the United States of trying to prevent the spread of the virus. Hospitals in some states are at capacity and the health system is starting to fail. The photo on the screen of a doctor in Texas comforting an elderly COVID patient in ICU on Thanksgiving's day went viral. As graphic and poignant as the scared, distressed man who only wanted the company of his wife is, it is the fact that this doctor had worked 252 consecutive days. That is more than eight months straight, which is truly shocking. And he is no exception. Health workers in the US are suffering extreme burnout, PTSD, as well as infections at a staggering rate, working in hospitals that are crumbling. On 9-11, 2001, 2,977 Americans died in the terror attacks. This was used as the pretext to launch wars, which cost $6 trillion, and has dramatically eroded the democratic rights of the American population. That death toll is now taking place every day. The response of the US government is nothing can be done as that would affect the economy. The Trump administration and their erstwhile political opponents in the Democratic Party declare there is no money for lockdowns, for financial support for affected workers and small businesses, because it would adversely impact Wall Street. Therefore, the death toll is, according to them, inevitable. The White House, the Trump administration, and the Democratic Party really has downplayed, mocked, lied about, and fundamentally ignored the, the virus in the interests of the stock market and corporate profits. Any illusion that a Biden administration if it actually assumes office is going to address this situation, needs to be dispelled. Only three days ago, Biden declared, and I quote, 
I don't want to scare anybody here, but understand the facts. We're likely to lose another 250,000 people dead between now and January. And then in the next breath, breath declared, we don't need a shutdown. The only perspective which Biden and his new administration is putting forward is that masks should be uh, worn for the next 100 days. The attitude of Biden and the Democratic Party toward the pandemic mirrors their response to Trump's attempt to overturn the election result and institute a dictatorial form of presidential rule. The outcome of the election held more than one month ago is entirely clear, with Biden recording 7 million more votes than Trump, yet it is still being disputed by Trump and the Republican Party. Trump is attempting to mobilize a right-wing fascistic base, especially concentrated in the state apparatus, the police and the military, to impose a police state. The Democratic Party, whose own members have been targeted for assassination, such as the Michigan governor Gretchen Whitmer, has maintained a criminal silence in the face of this threat. Why? Because they fear that by informing workers and youth of the very real danger of a fascist coup in the United States, it would provoke an outpouring of working class opposition. The Democrats fear the independent action of the working class far more than they do Trump's right wing gangs and the establishment media dutifully responds in kind. The Democrats know very well that America is a social powder keg, deeply divided between the fabulously wealthy financial aristocracy, which both they and the Republicans serve, and the vast majority of the population struggling to survive. The United States is the center of the crisis and collapse of world capitalism. It is the sharpest expression of a process which is underway in every country. The pandemic has exacerbated contradictions and tendencies which existed prior to its outbreak and exposed the bankruptcy and incapacity of this system to respond in the interests of society as a whole. As we have stated, capitalism is at war with society. The International Committee has described the pandemic as a trigger event, analogous to the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand that led to the outbreak of World War I. Just as World War I was the violent, bloody expression of the, the crisis of capitalism, so too is the pandemic. And just as it was the intervention of the working class, particularly in the form of the 1917 Russian Revolution, which brought to an end the carnage of World War I, so it must be the independent struggle and intervention of the working class to answer this crisis. The pandemic has exposed and it has accelerated processes that were well underway before the beginning of 2020. Governments and ruling classes in every country are now redoubling their efforts to impose the burden of the, the worsening crisis on their international rivals through intrigues and war and on the working class through austerity measures and anti-democratic laws. The development of a vaccine, even if it is able to be successfully distributed and administered, will not result in a return to normal. There will be no return to normalcy. The pandemic, like World War I, has irrevocably transformed the consciousness of billions of people internationally. Life will never be viewed in the same way as that prior to the pandemic. Any confidence that this social system can and will meet their most elementary needs has been shattered. This is an historic development and is international in its scope, a fundamental point that has to be grasped. While to date, and this is an entirely conditional statement because it can change overnight, the impact of the pandemic in Australia and New Zealand has not been on the scale of other countries, but it would be a grave error to assume that the attitude of the ruling class 
and their governments here are any different to their counterparts internationally. And while the health crisis is not as acute as elsewhere, the economic, social and political impact has been profound. There has been the same opposition by governments and corporate interests to lockdown, social distancing and contact tracing here as elsewhere. The March lockdowns were instituted due to the growing opposition to the continued operation of schools and workplaces. While governments closed parliament, then gyms, clubs and restaurants, the schools, factories, public transport remained open. In fact, quarantine hotels where returning overseas travellers were isolated were only established after the debacle of the Ruby Princess cruise liner, which was allowed by the state government to disembark all 2,700 passengers before testing results were known. Prior to the Victorian second wave, it was the single greatest source of infections and deaths in the country. As in every country, the pandemic has been used here as the mechanism and pretext for the further transfer of more than $400 billion from the government coffers to the bank accounts of corporate Australia, the banks and the stock markets. It has also been used to sideline parliament, establish the national cabinet, which as we have analyzed is a de facto national unity cabinet comprised of the federal government and all state governments, most of which are labor. The labor opposition and the ACTU immediately fell into line to implement what can only be described as some of the most far reaching attacks on working conditions, hours, pay rates, and the rights of the working class since the 1980s. These measures, however, were instituted from a position of profound weakness of the government and the Australian ruling class. The pandemic was detected in this country in late January and had its first peak toward the end of March. This situation, however, immediately followed the devastating bushfires of the summer of 2019-2020, which were the most destructive in history. The fires killed 34 people directly and more than 400 due to toxic air. It burned the equivalent of half the land mass of the United Kingdom and destroyed 6,000 homes. Even now, thousands of people are still homeless. But it was the fact that these fires, their ferocity, unpredictability and difficulty in combating them were strenuously warned about by fire chiefs and climatologists, but utterly ignored <clears throat> and derided by the Morrison government that provoked widespread hostility. The terrible impact of the fires was in large part the result of government inaction, denial of climate change, and the gutting of services to both prevent them and fight the fires. The seething opposition to the government was expressed most sharply toward Morrison himself, when he secretly flew off for a Hawaiian family holiday while the country burned. On his rushed return, the level of hostility was revealed during his visits to burnt out areas of New South Wales, where he was berated and forced to beat a somewhat hasty retreat by angry residents. Had there been an election in the first part of the year, the government would have without doubt been decimated. As with the fires, however, the pandemic itself had been predicted and warned about for decades prior. Moreover, it has been revealed that Trump was aware of its lethality as early as February and kept it secret so not to panic Wall Street. Without a doubt, other countries, including the valued US ally Australia, also knew. It was detected here following the large protests against the government handling of the fire crisis, and there was considerable concern in ruling circles about Morrison's ability to cope with further opposition concerning the, pa the pandemic. So the lockdowns were enacted in March in response 
to the growing hostility toward the government and its inaction, and the very real fear that the health system would collapse under conditions where it quickly reaches capacity even in the flu season. While politicians have patted themselves on the back over containing the virus, the second wave that spiralled out of control in uh, Victoria highlights the continuing dangers. Internationally and here, the pandemic has been the occasion for a refashioning of class relations. Almost immediately the lockdowns were enacted, unemployment hit levels not seen since the 1930s, creating mass queues at Centrelink which struck fear into the government. The increase in unemployment benefits in the job seeker benefit, which governments both Liberal and Labor had intransigently kept at below poverty levels for years, were to prevent opposition erupting under conditions where it was impossible to secure employment at all. The introduction of JobKeeper, which itself was a handout to business to keep workers on the books was designed to stop people having to access unemployment benefits. As these measures are wound back and will be eliminated in early 2021, it will bring into stark relief the real levels of unemployment, poverty, evictions and homelessness that are now being camouflaged. The economic recession that followed is the worst since the 1930s with the wages share of income falling under 50% for the first time in 70 years. Total wages have fallen by 2.5%, while profits soared by 15%, highlighting the massive transfer of wealth from the working class to business and the rich. <clears throat> However, the billions of dollars handed over to business must be paid back and that is what's being done through the intensified exploitation of the working class. Already working from home has been the basis for the elimination of penalty rates, the eight hour day and the establishment of pay freezes. The illegalization of strikes and virtually any collective action by the working class, laws first legislated by the Hawke Keating Labor governments in the 1980s in the accords and agreed to by all the unions is being used as a battering ram against the efforts by workers to oppose the impossible workloads being inflicted on it. Whether it is Australia Post workers, teachers, nurses, paramedics, warehouse workers, building workers, the driving up of productivity is unrelenting and it is not possible to sustain. The unification in that sense of the working class is being undertaken through the very conditions of its existence. Just as the internationalization of the working class, the existence of, of the working class, which is existing in uh, underdeveloped countries as it, as it is in the advanced capitalist countries is becoming unified. The unions, the Labor Party and the Greens have all collaborated in the suppression of the working class over the past decades. The unions increasingly are exposed as the mechanism for the imposition of corporate conditions onto the working class. Workers who resist these efforts are attacked and intimidated as was recently experienced by workers in Australia Post. What is being prepared in this country and imposed is an unprecedented social disaster. While the assault on the lives and conditions of the working class is pursued at home, so too is the drive to war abroad. The anti-China witch hunt is being accelerated as the economic and social crisis deepens. In line with the demands of the US Alliance, China has been targeted, including through anti-democratic foreign interference laws, demands for an inquiry into the source of the coronavirus and allegations of spying and hacking, all without evidence or substance. As other comrades have outlined, the historical, resp the hysterical response to a tweet by a Chinese official 
that depicted war crimes by Australian troops documented in the Brereton Report is bound up not only with vilifying China, but with intimidating any government, anti-government, anti-war sentiment at home. As Comrade Mike has outlined, the War Crimes Report, resisted and delayed as long as they could possibly do it, is to actually deflect from the real crimes of the Australian military and ruling class, so as to prepare for new wars, not only against foreign rivals, but against its most feared opponent, the working class at home. In commenting on the Brereton Report, the pseudo lefts of the Socialist Alternative and Socialist Alliance place full confidence in its findings and in fact cover for the role of Labor governments under which the majority of the war crimes were carried out. Their role is to ensure any opposition is confined to safe political channels within the political establishment and does not take an independent form. Throughout this crisis, the ICFI, the SEPs, and the, so and the World Socialist website has developed an analysis of the underlying conditions driving these events. That analysis is unrivaled internationally. There is no political party or media outlet which is comparable in its depth and volume of analysis. Our analysis is directed at the clarification and education of the working class. The mass opposition, which is developing throughout the US, Europe, the UK, Asia, India, and internationally, is the initial expression of a revolutionary movement of the working class internationally. The conditions under which the working class in every country now lives and works is increasingly impossible and unsustainable. But it must undertake these struggles by discarding and rejecting the old nationalist leaderships which defend capitalism. The fight for the creation of rank and file committees is an important first step in the political independence of the working class. What is decisive for this movement, however, is a political perspective and program a socialist program. In the founding document of the Fourth International, Leon Trotsky wrote, the historical crisis of mankind is reduced to the crisis of revolutionary leadership. By that he meant that without conscious revolutionary leadership, a party of the Bolshevik type, which is built and established in important sections of the working class prior to the outbreak of these struggles, a party which can develop a correct political perspective and orientation, those struggles, no matter how courageous, no matter how widespread, will be defeated. Therefore, we are at a turning point in history. There is not unlimited time. If you agree with this analysis, then you must act. Now is not the time to prevaricate or sit on the sidelines, but to join this party and to fight to build it, to lead the working class in the overthrow of capitalism, to rid the world of inequality and the inevitable descent to war and to establish a socialist society. That is the only way out of this crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Comrade Cheryl, for that very wide ranging and critical report. We'll now move to the question and answer portion of this public meeting. Uh, we will now, if I can get uh, the uh, all four comrades who gave their reports to uh, you know, put, put their cameras on, we will, you know, everyone can ask a question or anyone can ask a question of any of the four comrades who gave the report. Um, I know that we have one question in, but others should come in. I mean, any question that you have, uh, please put it in the chat. And remember to click the button that says to all panelists and attendees, uh, or else it will just be sent to us. So the first question, just to start us off, and others can think of questions and put them in the chat as we go. I just will also mention, I know that there was someone who had their hand up before. Uh, we're not taking speakers, but if you would like to ask a question, just 
please type it into chat if possible. So the first question, uh, which comes from Dolores, was why don't soldiers oppose these policies of war? Was a question that came in earlier. Uh, who wants to start us off? Perhaps Comrade Mike, you could start, and then others in the in the panel could begin to answer that question. Sure, I could make a couple of points. Thank you for the question, Dolores. Um, I think it does raise some questions of perspective, political perspective, which are quite important, actually. Uh, what? How are we going to stop the drive to war? The critical question is the role of the working class on a global scale, unification of its struggles against its own ruling class and you know, for a unified uh, fight against uh, being pitted to fight each other as happened in two world wars. And of course, let's remember as we've said already today that the first world war only ended uh, as a result of the Russian revolution. Um, so, what, who do we look to to fight the danger of war? It's not individual soldiers as such. It's the a power and mobilization and political clarification of, of the working class. Um, of course, individual soldiers are themselves, well, mostly in Australia's case, they're economic conscripts. They're, people who've been driven into the armed forces, uh, mainly by, by unemployment and so on. But once in the army, they are uh, subject to very brutal indoctrination and ideological preparation. You know, what's happened in the special forces is not just the special forces. These are the kinds of uh, preparation which goes on uh, throughout the military as a whole. And of course, these soldiers are put it lightly, are also under orders. Uh, insubordination can be, uh, can, can result in, in, in a, a death penalty in the military, of course. Uh, but I think the most important thing, just to come back to the fundamental political question, we don't look to the military itself or even to individual soldiers in that sense as the source of the you know, the struggle against war. What happens in the military will depend of, above all on what happens, you know, in the development of the struggle of the working class. I, mean, I just make this point because we've had some very bitter lessons historically on this front, you know, particularly in Indonesia and in Chile, where the Stalinists of the Communist Party uh, claimed that uh, soldiers were, you know, people in uniform and the military as a whole could be relied upon. But more recently, of course, in Egypt in 2011, that the military could play some sort of progressive role. Uh, unfortunately, this has led to, you know, one bloodbath after another. In Indonesia, you know, the uh, General Suharto was brought into the cabinet. In, uh, in Chile as well, Yende brought the, the, the Pinochet into his cabinet. Um, of course, in Venezuela, we've seen you know, Colonel Chavez, Hugo Chavez touted as a socialist, when in fact it was more or less a military coup. So I just think these are very important questions. We can't exhaust them right now, but we, we have to, the critical question is the development of the political clarification, mobilization, unification of the struggles of the working class. Once the working class movement develops, uh, that is going to change uh, the situation, you know, quite dramatically. So that's what we, that's our focus. And that's what we, we turn to. I just make those, those basic points at this stage. Uh, I think what Mike has, has raised is, um, is correct. Um, and just uh, without repeating what, what he has said, um, one of the reasons that in fact, uh, it was the SAS that were deployed to Afghanistan uh, to, the, to the exclusion of um, regular troops is not so much because there, there was necessarily fear of opposition, although 
um, the, the experience from Vietnam was that the, uh, the brutality, you know, the, the absolute opposition um, of, the, uh, of the population of these, of these occupied countries um, has an enormous impact. But the, the fear was that there would be, um, it would be such a difficult war and it would be so brutal that the body bags would start to come home and that would uh, elicit and provoke an anti-war sentiment, which, which undoubtedly and without question exists in Australia. I mean, per head of population, the 2003 uh, demonstrations, which were global against the Iraq war, uh, were some of the largest in Australia. There is enormous anti-war sentiment which exists in this country. And hence, that's one of the reasons that the attempt to have military on the beaches, military walking around the suburbs, uh, military knocking on doors, asking whether people are in lockdown, um, fighting fires and, and all those measures are being undertaken. There is an attempt to create an atmosphere where the military on the streets is something which is um, which the population is is used to. But I mean, what happens in the military is bound up with what happens in the working class and the the political struggles that are undertaken in the working class. And of course, that is bound up with a, a perspective, a political program, uh, which is, is, is fought for. If they're tied, if workers are tied to the unions, to the Labor Party, to the Greens, to these organisations whose perspective it is to maintain capitalism, possibly criticise, but let, nevertheless maintain capitalism, then no matter how widespread these struggles will be, they, they will be defeated. So that's why the role of our party, the role of the development of, of a revolutionary leadership is so crucial. So I have another question uh, here, question two from Mane. He writes, I think what was quite upsetting was the high rise of mental health under the impact of COVID-19. I believe everyone had created great initiatives in regards to catering to mental health, such as government implanting additional 10 free counselling sessions. Individuals have created Zoom meetings to create the inclusions that were lacking due to COVID-19. I guess I'm just hoping those same mental health initiatives remain after COVID-19. So uh, does one of our panellists want to discuss what's been raised? I'll just make a few points. I mean, I think that the, it's it's an important discussion about uh, you know where where this skyrocketing of mental health issues, suicidal ten tendencies, and so on, particularly among young people, actually arise from, and uh, how it is dealt with. I mean, one thing that the pandemic has laid bare, um, and and I think we have to stress that none of the issues that uh, or the majority of the issues that haven't been uh, that have been discussed today, they have not been created by the pandemic. What the pandemic has done is expose, exacerbate, and accelerate the tendencies uh, and conditions that do exist. But I think that the, the pandemic has laid bare the woeful inadequacies of uh, mental health care, uh, of uh, security, of living conditions uh, for the working class and young people across across the world. I mean. The fact of the matter is that under conditions of a pandemic, lockdowns are necessary. Uh, what what has come out of that um, has been isolation from friends, family, difficulties with jobs, um, uh, schooling, and all these kinds of things. What what should be provided for uh, all people under these conditions are adequate services to deal with the mental health issues that um, are arising as a result. I mean, I think that there's a very powerful and important article from the World Socialist website written by Genevieve Lee uh, on November 19th. Maybe someone can put a link to it in the chat. Um, 
The title of the article is Youth Suicides and Mental Health Disorders on the Rise Amid Pandemic and um, uh, a Pandemic Depression. And what Genevieve, I encourage everyone to read this article in its entirety. I couldn't just read it out here because it, it goes to the heart of some of the issues that have been raised. But what Genevieve uh, raises is that there does exist in society today massive resources, scientific knowledge, uh, and uh, richness to actually deal with and, and meet um, uh, the, the widespread emotional, social, and educational needs of uh, all people, particularly youth, while keeping them safe from the virus. But uh, as Genevieve explains, quote, under a socioeconomic system guided by science and reason, that is under socialism, workers would be compensated for staying home to care for their children. But later on, she says that th this is not what's being carried out under capitalism, because under capitalism, the primary motivation is the profit interests of a tiny wealthy minority. Everything else is subordinated to that. Um, and that's why, I mean, you have uh, things popping up amid the pandemic, um, uh, but, but it's mostly, you know, out of um, it, it's being put on individuals rather than um, being based on the, the social needs uh, or, or society. Make those points. Thanks, Evram. Anyone else want to comment or make any points in addition? Yeah, um, look, again, I, I think what Evram has raised is important. And, and in terms of the situation in Australia, um, the the ten um, the the ten free uh, um, visits to a, a, psycho a psychologist um, is certainly is certainly um, important, but this is literally a drop in the ocean, and compared to the destruction of mental health services which has been underway, particularly since the Richmond report in the 1980s, where whole uh, areas of mental health facilities and treatments were closed down. It, it answers nothing um, in terms of the mental health requirements that, that exist. Um, I mean, we have written, and there's, uh, there's an article by John McKay on uh, the World Socialist website, which, which relates to mental health services and the fact that I think, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's more than half of those who suffer mental health um, issues are actually treated, uh, either try and get treatment or if they do, are treated. In fact, increasingly, um, the most effective way of receiving treatment is to go to prison. Um, I mean, there, there are no beds in mental health wards. There are very few uh, facilities which exist um, on, a, on a national or even state level. And so the, the, the situation confronting those and the increasing, as Evram has gone through, the increasing uh, layers of people who are suffering mental health, which are, are young people. Uh, I mean, in that sense, all all sections um, of the population get get do not get the treatment that they require, and so this is literally a ticking time bomb, um, which which exists in this country. So the next question, and I think it is in fact quite a critical question. Uh, is uh, from Tony, who asks, is there any point to reformist or gradualist rather than revolutionary action? <clears throat> well, the short answer is no, Tony. Uh, I think that's uh, the import of every report given here today. Um, I mean, what um, one way of looking at the question is to ask, you know, in response, which government anywhere in the world is putting forward a reformist proposal? Um, there, there are none. Uh, and the ones that, uh, such as New Zealand, uh, which are held up as uh, supposedly a pr 
progressive alternative, um, it, it, it's a complete fraud as soon as you uh, look past the, uh, the media propaganda. Um, no, there's no possibility of reform. And, uh, you know, we approach this as Marxists. It's not a question of uh, the, um, you know, the, the bad uh, moral character of particular leaders or governments. Uh, the, the issue is, is uh, of the objective crisis of the capitalist system that has been developing over a very long period of time. Um, at, you know, the period of, of uh, social reforms which, uh, which followed uh, the Second World War, um, you know, was, and, and the, uh, the economic upsurge of that time uh, was really based on, um, you know, the, the dominance of, of the United States as an economic power, its ability to, uh, you know, basically uh, be the world's leader, to, to pour money into different countries throughout the world, uh, and to prop up the whole system. Um, of course, that was built on, on the deaths of millions of people and the rebuilding of, of the world after the Second World War. Um, you know, the, the, um, the globalization of production, uh, that, you know, that very process uh, took place um, over, over the course of the 1960s and 70s uh, has, has created a new crisis uh, it's totally undermined the post-war order, and uh, therefore, you know, the um, uh, the ability of governments to have a nationally regulated, insulated economy, uh, which was the basis for the previous reforms of the Labour Party and so forth, uh, just simply no longer exists. Uh, I mean, if um, you know, if if a corporation is uh, threatened with a with a higher taxation rate uh, in Australia. Um, it will simply threaten to shut down and move its operations to a country uh, with a much uh, cheaper, um, you know, cost of production and a much more favourable environment for making profits. Um, that's the situation that the working class confronts in every country. And, and that's uh, why it is so urgent uh, to build a, a party that unifies the working class in every country um, against capitalism. Uh, and, uh, and that's, you know, that's what we are fighting for. Um, other, others may wish to add to my very uh, uh, brief um, response, but. I can add a couple of points to that. I mean, I agree with what Tom said. Um, I think you've got to look at this historically, of course, like every other question that confronts the working class. Uh, first of all, you could say the death knell of reformism uh, was sounded in August 1914, when all of the social democratic parties who had claimed affiliation with Marxism, except for the Bolsheviks, all went off to war to support their own ruling class in that bloodbath of World War I. They, their whole perspective of working within the national framework uh, proved to be uh, catastrophic you know, for the working class. Now, the Bolshevik Party, I mean, I, I recommend reading, well, not just Rosa Luxemburg, the formal revolution, but also Lenin's work, The State and Revolution, written in the middle of 1917 on the eve of the October Revolution, where he explained the nature of the capitalist state it can't be reformed. It can't be changed from within. It's, it's uh, in a, organically and totally uh, part of the apparatus of, of rule by, by, by the capitalist class. It has to be overthrown. There needs to be a revolution. A revolution is a, a massive movement of millions of people. That's what is necessary to uh, reconstruct society entirely on socialist foundations. Um, and that, of course, requires a far-sighted, clear uh, leadership, a revolutionary party. That's why Lenin was writing the State and Revolution in those critical months of 1917, to clarify that question, against those even within his own party who were proposing uh, support for the provisional government of Kerensky, including, including Stalin, by the way. 
Um, so I just think some people say, oh, but that's unrealistic, you know, revolution. Unfortunately, as Marx explained, first of all, historically, there's no other way. Every great social change from one, from one economic order to another, whether it be from feudalism to capitalism or capitalism to socialism, requires, requires revolution. Uh, we stand in the great traditions in that sense of the French American and even the, the English revolution. Um, but today, is it realistic? Uh, is reformism realistic? As Tom's explained, it's, it's, it's even less realistic now than it was then. You know, after World War II, there was a period in which capitalism, capitalist class could provide a few crumbs off the table, as it were. But that's long gone. And uh, all the reformist parties and their trade union apparatuses, uh, which once peddled the line that workers in this country and elsewhere did not re need a revolution, they could get uh, enough reform out of the system. These have become transformed into apparatuses of reversing all the gains of the working class, of policing the requirements of the ruling class. Um, you know, I mean, well, just one, one example, Qantas has now sacked 2000 workers, outsourced them, the ground staff, the transport workers union, the union, which is affiliated to the Labor Party, actually put in a tender to become the cheap labor contractor for Qantas. And it was rebuffed. Qantas found a cheaper, a cheaper rival. In its own way, it's just another telling expression, first of all, of the accelerating attack on the working class that's been carried out through this pandemic and the, 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 the end product of, um, in that sense of, of reformism. So I just make those, make those points. Anyone else want to add anything? I mean, look, perhaps comrades can speak to it because the next question is interesting in that it, that it links in some ways uh, to the first. I mean, it's a question from Joyce and she says, why are people asking Trump to free Assange when he is the one that has charged him? How will Biden deal with Julian Assange? So uh, I think that's an important question that then, uh, you know, in that sense links to the other. So. Who would like to start us off on the question of Julian Assange and this question from Joyce? The Democratic Party has no differences with the treatment of, of Julian Assange um, to that of the, of the Republicans. Um, I mean, there, there has been no campaigns. There has been, in fact, they have, they have uh, their attitude, you know, to his incarceration. Um, has been identical as the Labor Party here has and um, uh, really all the political, um, uh, political organisations here. The, um, I mean, I'm not quite sure who you're referring to, who, who is calling on, if this was part of the um, inauguration, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, a uh, freeing of, of people. Um, but, you know, it, it, um, it, there is no difference. There, there, there is no difference. And, and as I said, I'm not sure who, who it is that, that you're referring to. Um, maybe other comrades can, but in regards to the Democrats, there will be no difference. Perhaps I, I can just briefly add, I, I agree with that. Um, Trump is reputedly going to pardon some people <laughs> and his own family and every other, lots of other criminals. Uh, and so there's, on social media, I think something of a campaign and maybe even promoted by people around WikiLeaks itself to uh, raise the idea of Trump pardoning Assange. Uh, one has to say it's a very bankrupt perspective, uh, first of all. Um, of course, Trump uh, stepped up the attack on Assange. Um, because, you know, precisely because Assange is regarded, is seen as, and WikiLeaks as a, you know, a, a uh, existential threat really to, you know, to the information it provides, the exposure it makes uh, are, are so dangerous, you know, to the ruling class. Um, so I think it's, what's our perspective? What do we fight for? 
you know, we don't, we say don't turn to the ruling elite and its political parties, whether it be the Republicans or the Democrats, turn to the working class, fight for its movement and mobilization. Insofar as we raise demands on, on, on governments, even the government here, we need to see it on behalf of uh, Assange, we do it from that standpoint. It, it's a, it's a, a way of raising the, the necessity for a movement from below, you know, against these governments. Um, I just make that point. And secondly, as Cheryl said, nobody should be under any illusions that a Biden administration will take any different stance whatsoever. Uh, Biden was part of the Obama administration, which began the whole um, persecution and vendetta against uh, Assange, along with Hillary Clinton, of course. Um, and so I, I just think we shouldn't have any illusions in turning to any ruling class elite of any kind. Um, everything depends, everything depends on the development of a, of a movement in the working class, you know, to demand freedom for Assange. And that's bound up, of course, also with the struggle against war and and, and uh, inequality and, and the attacks on the working class. These are these are all connected. I um, just make those points. We have some more questions, comrades. Um, the next one is from Kerry, who asks, "At such a critical time, what is the role of art?" Look, I think um, the fight of the Marxist movement, and I think it's. While it, it's it's a different issue, um, but it's very much related, um, is is expressed, I think, in our attitude and and intervention into the 1619 project. Now, this is not, you know, a a, a um, piece of art in that sense. But it reflects, and I think the um, the perspective that was written a couple of days ago, um, which is the introduction to the um, uh, book, which will be published on uh, the World Socialist websites um, and the Socialist Equality Party's intervention into the attempt to transform history, the attempt by the New York Times by Nicole Hannah-Jones, um, Jake Silverstein, all these, these layers to transform the history of the um, American revolutions from one of a, a historic and class struggle to, to one of, of um, racialism. And in fact, to put forward that the American revolution itself um, was not a progressive um, step forward for um, the development of, of um, mankind, but in fact was, was carried out to defend um, slavery, which is, is absolutely a, a slander on the American Revolution, as it was uh, and is on the, the um, approach of the, the, civil, <clears throat> the civil war. Um, you know the, uh, and I think as the um, uh, the perspective outlines, I mean the American Revolution was a an enormous inspiration and development, <clears throat> which had an impact in France, in Britain, in throughout Europe, um, and in the fight for, in that sense, the rights of of man. Um, it was based on the Enlightenment, on the on all the developments of science and art, um, and in fact, what what Marxism fights to do, what it fights for, is it it stands on the shoulders in that sense of all the historical, uh, scientific, technological, artistic developments of mankind. It it. Um, it embraces in that sense all these developments and it, it also relates to the question about reformism because in that sense what is taking place what is being carried out by the ruling class what is being carried out by the bourgeoisie is in that sense the attack even on its own history on its own um, intellectual and historical gains which have been under underway I mean, the, the declaration of the rights of man, uh, the equality of, of man, 
is itself something which is fought for and 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 uh, defended by the the Marxist movement. The fact that Trump, um, and this is why that the prospect of reformism is not just fanciful but bankrupt, is because the ruling class now, in that sense, tears down what it itself. Um, developed and and uh, brought in, you know, fought for, um, you know, the, the the democratic rights in that sense of, and the rights of, of uh, democracy within the United States and internationally is now being torn asunder, as is the, 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 the gains of medicine. I mean, you have, you have a, a president um, which puts forward snake oil uh, remedies, injecting oneself with bleach, um, that the, the pandemic is, is nothing to be concerned about, that it's a little flu, that everybody should get it, it to deny everything which has been, uh, has been learned and gained through medicine. It's the same in regards to, to um, art, literary pursuits. I mean, you have, um, in fact, the, the attack on, on art is being carried out on an on international scale. Books such as To Kill a Mockingbird Band, um, you know, books uh, such as um, From Mice and Men, um, because words such as nigger and and you know these sorts of conceptions um, are, are, are aired in there are raised in there all these everything is being banned um, you know the attack on on Lincoln on Washington um, this is this is now comes under assault and so in order so that the appropriation in that sense um, of, of art takes on a revolutionary role. It has to be it has to be carried out as part of the fight to raise the um, the level of culture, of intellectual pursuits, of um, knowledge. I mean, we fight for the the minds of the working class of young people. We certainly appeal to their hearts and, and morals, but we fight for their intellect and for the development of the consciousness of, of the working class. And that includes art and literature and all aspects of, of culture. So I think it's, it's a, it, it, it really is a, a profoundly important, important question. And, and as uh, the the um, uh, the perspective went through, you know the the attack being carried out um, on the the historical uh, history, the history of of the United States of of, of America, um, to to transform this into a racialist um, black and white uh, question. In that sense, reminds one of the Nazis. And the role of race and the the um, use of, of race in the attack against Jews, and the attack against the working class as a whole, because what is it about fascism, which in that sense is different to dictatorial forms of rule, military forms of rule, is that what fascism fights to do is to atomize, destroy the very organisational and, uh, and autonomy of the working class. And of course, that has to include its organisations, its, its very organisations, but also every other aspect of, of um, man's development, which of course includes um, science, technology, um, literature, art. And, and so the, the issue that is raised in regards to the question of reformism, um, I think is, is in that sense related to this. I mean, it, it, there, is, there is no possibility of reformism. That period is gone. What now 
the working class confronts is, is right wing and fascist layers whose, whose perspective is the very destruction of the working class. So in order for workers to defend anything, it in fact has to overthrow capitalism. And that's, that's the, the conclusion, the task, which now confronts workers on an international scale. Comrade Tom? Yeah, I thought I'd just add a few thoughts on this question. I mean, um, I very much agree with what Cheryl has just said, you know, um, uh, there is, there's a sense in which we've argued on the World Socialist website that the working class really has to come to the defense of art and culture, which is under attack in so many different ways. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as Cheryl said, the ruling class is tearing down its own culture, its own um, uh, achievements in, in uh, the field of art uh, from previous uh, periods of history. I mean, we wrote uh, some years ago about the campaign um, in Detroit when Detroit became bankrupt after the financial crisis. Um, and this was in 2015, I think. You know, the, the, the demand of the ruling class was to sell off all the artworks to wealthy people that, that from the Detroit Institute of Art in order to um, pay back the, uh, the debt. And our party, the Socialist Equality Party in the United States, uh, fought against that very vigorously and uh, organized workers to, um, you know, express their opposition to that really reactionary um, and vandalistic uh, attempt. Uh, and uh, in opposition, I should say, to the trade union bureaucracy, which took a totally Philistine attitude and said, you know, workers can't eat art was the, was the phrase they used. Um, in other words, uh, these, you know, truly uh, wonderful works by, by uh, I think Van Gogh and other artists were of no value um, from their point of view uh, to, to working people. We totally reject that. Uh, I should also th think, I should also mention the pandemic has had a totally devastating effect on artists um, who aren't, you know, aren't able to reach audiences in the same way. Of course, film productions have been shut down as well. And uh, in many cases, people are being uh, plunged into poverty like the working class as a whole. Um, but art is also under attack in those, um, you know, really insidious uh, ideological ways, um, such as the 1619 Project. Um, and I would really urge the person, the people who asked the question about this to read David North's introduction to the new book um, on uh, which collects our uh, analysis on the 1619 Project, the New York Times efforts to rewrite history from the standpoint of racial identity politics and race being the, uh, the you know, the critical division in, in American society. Um, in some ways, this has become the religion of the upper middle class. And uh, I think it, it has a hugely damaging effect, not just on history and science, but on culture uh, in general. I mean, one argument put forward is that Beethoven is overrated um, because he's a white man, he's received too much praise. Um, there are films that we've defended, such as The Free State of Jones, which, which uh, was denounced uh, because it truthfully depicts um, the uh, united struggle of white farmers and, and slaves uh, against the Confederacy during the Civil War. It was denounced as a, uh, a white savior narrative um, by the identity politics crowd, which really is seeking to divide up the working class and to prevent any uh, unified movement of workers. So I think um, the defense of art is an absolutely critical task of, of the Marxist party and, and Leon Trotsky devoted considerable attention to it. Um, wrote, he wrote uh, the book, um, uh, Literature and Revolution. Um, there's also a, a wonderful book by uh, Voronsky, um, Alexander Voronsky, uh, Art as the Cognition of Life. Um, so I'd encourage the uh, listener to uh, read those works. And as for the question that I see another person has asked, you know, can an artist also be a revolutionary? Well, absolutely they can. And in this period, they should. And, uh, you know, why not? Uh, we certainly 
uh, have artists in our movement and and um, part of the problem facing artists is in a sense that they're, they're typically they they are from I suppose upper middle class layers of society um, not through any fault of their own it's just that those layers have more access to education and to the necessary leisure to produce art but as a result of that they're isolated somewhat from the working class and um, I think uh, you know it's incumbent on artists uh, you know serious artists to overcome that uh, and uh, and the party can play a major role in that the, the uh, Marxist party so just wanted to make those comments. Look I, I know we've got to finish up but um, <clears throat> Comrade Sue actually has just um, pointed us to a quote from uh, Dave Walsh, David Walsh, who um, who has written the book uh, Sky Between the Leaves, which is actually on um, is is on offer to today. Um, Comrade Max will be outlining it. But as as Dave Walsh says, we begin from the premise that the working class must consciously intervene and change the course of history. This is not something that can be done behind its back. Every ounce of our energy must be exerted to assist workers in deepening their knowledge of society, history, human behavior, psychology. The success of the socialist project depends on a far higher level of knowledge and thinking within far wider sections of the population than currently holds sway. The artistic cognition of the world is essential in this process. Art, Trotsky insisted, has made human beings more complex and flexible, generalizing their experience and widening their horizons, raising their psyche to a higher level and enriching their minds in a multitude of ways, which is obviously far better than I could have um, outlined, but, and, and certainly I would, I would encourage everyone who has not, um, uh, been able to get a copy of Sky Between the, the Leaves to do so because it is such an important um, point and the, the points that Tom has raised I think are, are correct. Um, this, you know, this, I mean, it, it is our task to, to develop all aspects of our knowledge, our, uh, de, you know, our culture, our understanding and this is, of course is part and parcel of it. Look, th thanks, Comrade Cheryl, and, and thank you, uh, Tom, Mike, and Evram as well for answering those questions. I do apologise uh, if we didn't get to your question. Uh, we should, I mean, I think everyone who asked a question, we've got your contact details. If not, let us know, and we will get in contact with you and have a further discussion. All your questions are important, and we will endeavour to answer them. Um, with that, though, I will draw the question and answer section to a close. So. Uh, again, thank you, Cheryl, Tom, Evram, and Mike. You can turn off your uh, uh, videos if you would like. As has been detailed by our speakers today, 2020 has been a year without precedent. What is clear is that we have entered a period of renewed revolutionary upheaval. The potential for a socialist transformation of society is great, but what is required to see this transformation and to prevent humanity slipping into barbarism is the resolution of the crisis of revolutionary leadership as Comrade Cheryl went through in her report. And our party or our world party alone is fighting to resolve this crisis. This year has been a difficult one. Uh, due to the pandemic, we halted the majority of our regular campaign since March. This has meant that we've had to seek new ways and means of reaching out to the working class across social media platforms. The relaunching of the World Socialist website was done with the understanding that the ongoing international social explosions will draw hundreds of thousands of workers to our website looking for history, theory and socialist politics. And this assessment has been vindicated. However, this too has come with a significant increase in workloads so that the website can be properly curated to meet the task before the party. Look, this work must continue to deepen and expand. And it is critical in this period that the revolutionary party is able to operate as freely as possible to develop the consciousness of workers internationally. And for this to happen, we require resources. That is why I'm appealing to you today to make the most generous donation possible to our party. 
Each month, we must raise our $25,000 monthly fund to continue our operations. December, as everyone knows, is effectively a short month due to the holidays. And we need to raise this money as early as possible, as early in the month as possible, so we continue to, to operate through into the new year. So that's why, again, I ask you to donate as generously as possible. Um, so I'd like to point everyone to our literature, which we have available for sale. Uh, as has been made clear, a critical aspect of the fight for the development of consciousness for all people is the need to study and draw the lessons of the key experiences of the working class in the 20th century. Uh, I will go through a number of these books, but if anyone would like to order them, you should see both in the chat and in uh, on the slide that you can email us at mering at uh, aussiemail.com.au. As you can see at the bottom, mering at aussiemail.com.au. And the first two books we have on screen, as you can see, is The Unfinished 20th Century and The Quarter Century of War. The Unfinished 20th Century uh, is a series of lectures delivered by Comrade David North, Chairman of the World Socialist Website International Editorial Board. Uh, it, puts the, it, it, you know, it puts forward that 100 years after the outbreak of the First World War and the Russian Revolution, none of the problems of the 20th century have been resolved. In fact, they oppose more sharply today. And it goes through all of these essential questions in the numerous uh, lectures uh, and, and introduction that's in there. And as you can see today, we have a, a, a special on, it's uh, $21.20, so uh, it's a reduction today. The other is obviously a quarter century of war. Uh, again, uh, a series of lectures by Comrade David North, uh, which uh, you know, goes through the catastrophes of the last three decades of war waged by the United States, uh, you know, breaking apart any of the conceptions of a defense of human rights and a war on terror. Uh, and that this, you know, is building towards greater wars, in particular uh, against uh, China and Russia. The next slide uh, we have, which has already been anticipated, the sky between the leaves, uh, which is uh, $25. Uh, again, uh, uh, I mean, can't say much more than what has been said, an essential book for anybody and also a really good Christmas gift. We are moving into Christmas and this is something that, you know, many people find interest in and I would really encourage those uh, who have not purchased it or are looking for Christmas gifts for friends and family to put an order in for this. And the last book uh, that we're uh, pointing to today is In Defense of Marxism. Now this year marks the 80th anniversary of the assassination of Leon Trotsky. And we've commemorated this event by uh, publishing on our website a series of lectures by Comrade David North, which I encourage those here who haven't uh, to take a look at and read. And a critical book or series of pamphlets and letters that were published or sent through by Comrade or by Leon Trotsky on uh, in his last year, which became his last year, is contained in In Defense of Marxism. It's a critical book for anyone uh, fighting uh, you know, to develop a Marxist perspective uh, and drawing the lessons of history. Uh, so any, uh, I really encourage everybody here today uh, to purchase this book. Finally, and this was uh, put forward by Comrade Cheryl in her important report, I encourage everybody here today who hasn't already to make the most important decision of your life and join the Socialist Equality Party. We are in a critical situation uh, there is uh, no time to lose in that sense. Workers and young people have to get off the sidelines and have to take up the fight for socialism. If you would like to join, uh, you can now join through our website, get involved. Uh, the link is in the chat, but it's sep.org.au slash website slash about slash get dash involved. Uh, you can also uh, contact us through the website or directly contact us um, uh, through other means, emails, etc but I, I do encourage those who haven't already to make the most important decision of your life and take up the fight for socialism. With those announcements, uh, I wanna thank again, Comrade Cheryl, Mike, Evram uh, and Tom for their important reports and discussion. And I also wanna thank all of the attendees who came along today to participate in our public forum. Thank you very much uh, and we'll be in contact. Thank you, see you.